and school improvement. Let's do an audio check before we get started. If you could put up your hand or write in the text box that you can hear my voice. Oh, I see a couple of hands. Great. Okay, it sounds like people are hearing my voice, so that is a um, good start. During this webinar, we'll be using the question box, and Marcia will be monitoring those questions. So as you have questions, please write them in the text box, and we will address them as we're going along. Thank you again for joining us on our webinar, School Supports and School Improvement. This is actually the third webinar in a series of four seeking additional feedback on Idaho's Consolidated State Plan under ESSA. This plan is our application for approximately $83 million in federal funds. These funds supplement the state's $1.7 billion commitment to education in Idaho. Federal funds flow directly to districts to serve academically at-risk students. The Idaho State Board of Education has worked with the department to ensure that Idaho's ESSA Consolidated State Plan aligns to Idaho's strategic plan as outlined by the governor's task force recommendations for K-12 education. The Accountability Oversight Committee, which is a subcommittee of the Idaho State Board of Education, has led the work around accountability section of the plan. Both the Office of the State Board staff and staff from the Idaho Department of Education work together on this committee. The Idaho Consolidated State Plan under ESSA is one small but important piece of Idaho's overall education plan. Presenting and gathering uh, feedback with me today are Marcia Beckman, Associate Deputy Superintendent of Federal Programs, Carlyn Laraway, Director of Assessment, and Jeff Church, Press Secretary. Our goals today are to share information on how the Idaho Department of Education plans to support schools and improvement and to gather feedback from you in this area. As we conduct the webinar, consider these guiding questions. What are the most helpful ways the state can support all schools, and especially schools and improvement? What should the state stay away from and leave completely to the local school district, even if the school is underperforming? How should the state intervene with low-performing schools? And what should the exit criteria be for moving out of comprehensive support and improvement? We'll come back to these questions at the end of the webinar. You may recognize this slide from the first webinar in our series, the State Goals and Accountability System webinar. Part of this webinar included reviewing the state's process for identifying schools in improvement. ESSA requires states to use specific indicators in the accountability framework to identify at a minimum the lowest performing 5% of schools receiving Title I Part A funds for comprehensive support and improvement. The system for identification will incorporate achievement and growth for the required indicators, academic achievement, graduation rate, English language proficiency, and a non-academic school quality measure. Schools will be identified in three categories, K through eight, high school, and alternative high school. This means that 5% of the lowest performing Title I schools will be identified from the K-8 group, from the high school group, and from the alternative high school group. Idaho will also identify non-title schools that fall into the low performance range. Under ESSA, there are two main categories of schools and improvement. Comprehensive support and improvement schools, which we call CSI, and targeted support and improvement schools, which we call TSI. Simply stated, comprehensive support and improvement, or CSI schools, are the schools representing 5% of the lowest performing, lowest growing schools and all high schools with a graduation rate less than 67%. The targeted support and improvement, or TSI schools, are those schools with the highest achievement gaps. Both the CSI and TSI schools will be identified in 2018 
not 2017, as previously communicated by the federal programs team during the CFSGA workshop. This decision was made about a month ago. Identification will be based in part on three years of ISAT data, 2016, 2017, and 2018. CSI schools will be notified prior to the start of school for the 2018-19 school year. I don't see any questions at this time, but please feel free to ask questions as, uh, as we go. CSI schools are identified every three years to the U.S. Department of Education. You will notice that for CSI schools, both the LEA and state have requirements. The state is responsible for notifying the LEA if it has any schools identified for comprehensive support and improvement, approving the school improvement plan for the CSI school, and monitoring and periodically reviewing the CSI school's plan implementation. So those are requirements of the state. The LEA is responsible for engaging stakeholders in writing an improvement plan, for developing and implementing a plan for the school, that includes informing student inform that a plan that is informed by student performance against the long-term goals, includes a school level needs assessment, identifies resource inequity, and includes evidence-based interventions. Tyson Carter and Kathy Gobby from the Title I team are currently developing a plan template that may be used for school improvement and school-wide. This school-wide improvement plan is called the SWIP, S-W-I-P, and Kathy and Tyson will provide training during the 2017-18 school year on this new tool. In this presentation, we will focus on the comprehensive support and improvement schools, specifically those schools whose performance falls in the lowest 5%. But first, let's take a quick look at requirements for the targeted support and improvement schools. For TSI, that includes that the state must notify each LEA if it has any served schools, so participating Title I schools, with a subgroup of students consistently underperforming, and that the state will ensure that the LEA provides notification to that school. The school has a responsibility to engage stakeholders to develop and implement a plan that is informed by subgroup data against the long-term goals, that includes evidence-based interventions, is approved by the LEA, notice not the SEA, not the state, but the LEA, and is monitored by the LEA, not the state. The plan also includes additional action following unsuccessful implementation of the plan, if that ends up being the case. Uh, let's pause just for uh, a moment to see if there are any questions. I see Gerald saying yes. <laughs> okay, he can hear me. All right, great. All right, well, um, we'll go ahead and proceed, but again, if you have questions as we move forward, please ask them. Let's take a look at what support looks like for the comprehensive support and improvement schools, and remember, those are the schools performing in the lowest 5% range. Supports are provided through what we call the State Technical Assistance Team, or STAT, S-T-A-T. The comprehensive support and improvement schools, or CSI schools, will make up approximately 20 to 25 schools receiving support from the stat. The Idaho Department of Education strategic plan goal number two drives the work of the state technical assistance team. And that goal is that all education stakeholders in Idaho are mutually responsible for accountability and student progress. Whereas No Child Left Behind was a punitive law, the Every Student Succeeds Act really emphasizes support. I liken it to No Child Left Behind be a closed, being a closed mindset law and ESSA being more of a growth or outward mindset law. This circle of support that you see on the screen is significant in that it represents all the stakeholders at the table together with one goal in mind, and that goal is to improve student achievement in that school. 
The people around this circle are experts in their area, and they are knowledgeable about evidence-based strategies to support the students, the teachers, and the leaders in the school. Most important, this circle represents committed individuals who are ready to understand the needs, the objectives, and challenges for improving in the school. The people around the table are ready and committed to adjust their efforts to help the school. And here at the Idaho Department of Education, we all hold ourselves accountable for the support provided to each CSI school. The school and LEA leadership are critical stakeholders in this circle of support, and you will see them identified in, in uh, a couple of the boxes. Some of the people around the table are experts in, for example, school improvement for um, data analysis, student engagement, school choice, career technical education, the Idaho Building uh, Capacity Regional Coordinators, Professional Development, Special Ed, and so forth. A core team of us at the ISDE have been meeting almost weekly for a year and a half. At first, our meetings were centered around understanding the new law. Then they grew into involving stakeholders and drafting a plan, and we're currently working on the seventh version. And this plan articulates how Idaho will meet the requirements of the new law. Alongside the ESSA plan meetings, we began developing the State Technical Assistance, or STAT, process. As the plan solidifies and is submitted September 18th, these meetings are focused on developing school improvement processes of support through the STAT. As we get closer to implementation of the STAT, the circle will widen and more people will be involved. A typical meeting may look something like this. Think about the circle of support we just looked at. Our goal is that we will be power, um, our goal is that this, this circle of support will be powerful and helpful to have all the expert players around the table to help review data, listen to the school and district report out, and identify next steps. The stat will meet regularly. However, we haven't quite determined how often that will be. Meeting monthly or even every two months may not be realistic considering there will be up to 25 uh, CSI schools. However, we want to meet often enough to stay connected to the school. Meetings will take place face-to-face -face when that can be arranged. Otherwise, meetings will take place virtually. The Idaho Building Capacity, or IBC, project is revamping. Most of the schools currently participating in IBC will transition out of the current project during the 17-18 school year to make room for the comprehensive support and improvement schools that will be identified next summer in 2018. The capacity builder will play an important role as a case manager or facilitator for the comprehensive support and improvement schools and its district. For example, during the 2018-19 school year, the capacity builder can help the school complete a comprehensive needs assessment. The capacity builder can help write the school improvement plan where the priorities, strategies, and resources are identified. Ongoing support from the capacity builder may include monitoring the implementation of the plan, helping evaluate implementation effectiveness, and always making ongoing resource connections for the school based on what it needs. The important thing to remember here is that the ISDE is committed to doing whatever it takes to help the CSI schools. This slide is not an exhaustive list. Think again about that circle of support. The capacity builder will play an important role in connecting the school and the district to all the supports and resources it needs. Whatever it takes will include some flow-through money, a minimum of $50,000 a year, to the CSI school. It could include deep data dives, um, involvement in the IBC project, coaches, ELA coaches, math coaches, uh, involvement in the Idaho Principals Network, the Superintendents Network, 
the principal's mentoring project, and so forth. So what happens if a comprehensive support and improvement school does not meet the state's exit criteria after three years? Although we'll, we are still working on the exit criteria for CSI schools, the goal is to ensure that the school is no longer in the lowest 5% group and that it is showing significant improvement in either growth and or achievement. The law requires states to provide more rigorous interventions for those schools re-identified after three years. These interventions include a notification of insufficient progress from the Superintendent of Public Instruction to the Idaho State Board of Education, to the local school board, to the superintendent of the LEA with the building principal copied. More rigorous interventions um, could include the, the, the state board may direct the use of some of the LEA state continuous improvement funds for board training and school improvement. It could include a leadership coach assigned to the school board and LEA leader to inform school improvement at the local level. State-led review of systems and processes at the LEA and school level will be conducted. Continued CSI status will also be noted on the school report card. Before we go back to the guiding questions, which we saw at the beginning of the webinar, this is just a reminder that the final webinar in this series is next Thursday, July 13th, and it will focus on supports for educators and educator effectiveness. All the webinars in this series are or will be archived at the link on your screen. Now let's go back to the guiding questions. I'll pause here, and if you have some comments um, to these questions, we would love to hear what they are, or if you have questions about the information in the webinar, we're also interested in what you're thinking. I'll go ahead and read the questions in case that might be helpful. What are the most helpful ways the state can support all schools, and especially schools in improvement? What should the state stay away from and leave completely to the local school district, even if the school is underperforming? How should the state intervene with low-performing schools? And what should the exit criteria be for moving out of comprehensive support and improvement? And I see we have a question. Marcia? So I'll, I'll read the, the, I'm going to read the actual comment. The problem is how to prevent schools from becoming low-performing schools. This has to be addressed. Very good comment. Um, I think that's uh, something we can talk about, how we incorporate that in this particular plan. Um, we aren't addressing that, but I do think that's been the major com conversation behind um, our department's uh, goals and what we're trying to accomplish, Governor's Task Force. Um, so we might need to center this particular question there. If anybody else has anything to add to that one? Second question, are the coaches familiar with all the teaching methods? The coaches, I will just start responding to that. The coaches that we will be utilizing have um, distinguished themselves through um, their previous work in education. They have either certainly attained the, the level of leadership at a school level, uh, many at the district level. The regional coordinators, one of their particular uh, missions is to provide uh, annual, well actually I think they meet two to three times a year at least, two times a year, so where they can um, uh, do training, uh, get to know one another, find the strengths and weaknesses. We bring in folks 
uh, both from the department as well as from outside to give them uh, ideas about all the different teaching strategies. No one person would know everything, but as Karen said earlier, we are very interested in making sure they can help make connections to the people that have those answers if, in fact, it is not them. One should rely on how the problems oops, should rely on not how the problems is handled Singapore, not USA. I'm, I'm well aware. Uh, I remember the movement of Singapore Map and how successful that was. So those are, that's a good observation. Thank you very much. Um, what constitutes a low-performing school? Gerald has asked that question. Uh, so Gerald, when uh, we identify the low performing schools, they will be low in both performance and in um, their, their, uh, their growth, growing from one year to the next or not. Also, uh, Will Overgaard, thank you for your question. Please review the timeline for data collection to determine the first round of identified CSI at CSI schools. Absolutely. So these schools will be identified in um, probably August of 2018 based on, uh, uh, and we will use the 2018 ISAT data as part of the data that uh, we are looking at to identify those schools. Is that, does that answer your question, Will? Are you looking for something else when you say data collection? Okay. Yeah, I, I would think what we're looking at, of course, just remember, we are looking over time. We now have three years of data. So we actually have now um, our 15, 16, and 17 data. And then this will mean we would have the 18 data so that we can look at a trend rather than an anomaly of up or down. The next uh, comment is there a or question, is there a place for parent feedback on the improvement plans? The answer to that is yes, but I'm going to let Karen expound a little on the template we have with for the SWIP, school-wide improvement plan. Uh, yes, thank you, Amy, for your question. Uh, actually involving parents in the development and the implementation of the school improvement plan uh, is, is a requirement for both CSI and TSI schools. And it will definitely um, be uh, uh, part of the template and uh, part of what we look at when um, state, when the state is reviewing and approving the CSI schools and when the LEA is reviewing and approving the CSI schools. Okay, and the next comment is, in mathematics, the proper approach to stimulating minds is the missing element. I think uh, we can call it anything from stimulating the mind to engagement and um, the whole idea behind the curriculum around mathematics, for example, has, have, as you are mentioning, has definitely moved into a course of engaging the child, not just teaching them to memorize algorithms necessarily. So we do hope that uh, the way we have defined our standards for mathematics as well as how we teach mathematics is actually moving in that direction, but it's always a work in progress. Thank you for the comment. Um, and is, is school a low performing when there is a wide range of students' performance? The, uh, the first thing I will give, and I that would appreciate anybody else's comments on that, is if there is a uh, the all student group, as an, uh, an all student group is low performing and we don't see growth either over this period of time. That school, if they then fall in the lowest 5% of schools, would be identified. However, when they move into the school-wide improvement planning process, the needs assessment, the prioritization, they may look at which particular group of students seems to be showing the lowest uh, or having the most difficulty with the achievement. And then the resources would be to work specifically maybe within certain groups to help those that work out or whatever. But the needs assessment is going to be very critical to that particular comment. Uh, we have a couple of, oh, thanks Amy, yes. We do think that parent involvement is awesome. 
Uh, we have a couple of K-3 schools. Uh, is growth for them only comparing third grade from year to year? There are different groups of kids each year. That is correct. Actually, the growth that we're going to use, um, I think uh, we, rather than the looking at the students' growth from year to year, we're really looking at the school growth from year to year. So how many students were proficient or advanced last year as opposed to how many? And um, therefore, we're not using the student performance for this particular purpose. Remember, this purpose is to identify our lowest 5% of schools as far as student growth is concerned, that's something that's reportable. Carlin? Dale, this is Carlin Larraway, the Director of Assessment. I think what you're um, getting at is in a K-3 school, you're correct. The growth would be reflective of a different cohort of students each year. So really what you're considering in that analysis is a systematic approach to, um, you know, the education of students up to third grade and preparing them for meeting those um, those critical third grade benchmarks um, or performance um, as it is measured on the ISAT test in, e in English language arts and math. So you are correct. Um, in a K-3 school, the growth is then only comparing third grade from year to year, um, looking at the performance of a, of a group of students in third grade last year compared to this year. Um, and that is correct. Yeah, I appreciate your colleagues' emphasis on the K-1-2 years are very critical to how a student does in third grade. So that is, uh, that is what we're looking to see. From year to year, are those third grade students being prepared as they take the test? That's why it's the school, this year's third graders to, to uh, last year's third graders. Next comment, uh, when parents are involved, students thrive. They are not the lower performing. When parents are absent, students would stagnate and not perform. These non-committed parents need to be engaged. You couldn't uh, have stated that in a better way, but uh, uh, we would, that's one of the reasons parent involvement from the federal requirements all the way down to what this particular school wants uh, is that parents need to be engaged. When children understand their parents have an, it's actually a very important role in their education, it is very important. Uh, we actually have a family and community engagement coordinator. We uh, do have some of those resources. So when we look at that circle that Karen showed on the slide of all the different folks, it is possible that when they do their needs assessment, one of the things they determine is that they have low parent involvement of the students who are not showing good progress. This would be a, a place where we would hope to connect them to more resources to build their parent involvement for all students in the school. Thank you for the comment. Very true. Notification of a low-performing school in August seems a bit late to be informed for the 18-19 school year. Do you plan on pre-notifying schools and administrators that a school most likely will be on the list? Excellent comment. Um, it is a tight turnaround. Nobody's going to disagree with you on that one. Um, the pan the, the one couple of things I think I will mention and anybody else who wants to add the first year of the school improvement uh, status, if you will, is a planning year. So it's not like we expect a plan written, hit the ground, feet running, uh, the day school opens in September. We know that's not true. I think it needs sometimes determining just exactly what's not working is a, a very important, and sometimes it, we have to give it its time. However, we don't want to waste time because children are there only for that year and they have to move on and we need, they need the best education they can get. So we're trying to find that blend between thoughtful planning for actions that would be helpful as well as giving a school time to do that without taking too much away from improving instruction while children are currently, you know, depending on this to learn. So that's one thing I thought I would mention about that. Uh, we also are cautious about uh, not letting each school have the opportunity to 
look at their preliminary test scores and determine accuracy of any of the elements uh, that we have here. And so the appeals process, in fact, Carlin's group is very involved in that process. Uh, we want that to be accurate. There is another consideration that is once you name a list, then it is public record. And if after you name a list, then a school comes off of that, it could create some confusion. So we're trying to find the best place. I do think the best approach is you will have a full year supported by the facilitator or the case manager, the, ca the capacity builder, to connect yourself with people who can get you started um, and help guide you through uh, the planning process, the identification of the needs, prioritizing of what you need to do, and moving forward. In fact, as soon as you have uh, completed that particular process, then uh, actually the grants that we referred to would be available. One more th thing to add to that, um, as Marcia said, you know, you are allowed some time um, in what we call an appeals window to review your preliminary participation rates and, and um, proficiency level um, distributions for based on the most recent year's test scores. And um, while schools receive uh, test scores within 10 days of students completing the assessment, a final statewide um, file is not provided until the end of June. And so in order for us to process that data and turn that around to you and give you that opportunity to appeal any participation rate or proficiency calculations, um, it pushes us into July when we've heard from very many schools across the state that that's a time most of your staff is out. So um, trying to find the right, the right window in order to conduct that appeals timeline um, is critical for all of you and also for the department. So we don't, um, we, it's not lost on us that that is a, a tough timeline to be notified in August just straight, right before school starting. So that's one of the reasons that that first year is that planning year and that, that initial evaluation year. So I think that's an, uh, a, a factor we considered when looking at our timelines and the reason that we made that first year a, a planning year. Thanks, Carlin. Next question is having additional summertime in the plan. Um, I was wondering if you could clarify, are you talking about for planning or summer instruction for students? If you could clarify, we'll answer that. I'm going to go on to, uh, Will, your question about will there be 5% of the schools in improvement in each group identified for improvement K-8 high school, all school? The answer to that is yes. There will be 5% in each of those groups. And, oh, thank you for the clarification, summer instructions for the students. Um, there is always that opportunity to have summer school uh, that can be actually uh, paid for, supported with Title I funds, migrant education funds, or the school district if they would so feel they had that. I, I do know that money is not exactly uh, laying around waiting to be found, but uh, on the other hand, those, obviously, the two strategies of either more time or different strategies are well known in helping children who do not grasp the concept to get the concept. Sometimes you just, you go over it again a couple of times and then they get it. Another is to change the method in which you, you get the information out, doing it a little bit differently. In fact, referring back to the math instruction, more hands-on approach, and some children get it in that way. So, uh, good comment. Thank you. These are very, very helpful comments. Um, by the way, just as you can say more, we have plenty of time. If you have other questions or, or comments that you'd like to ask, the uh, Actual comments are printed off. We have printed off the comments and questions from all of the previous webinars, and then we will also do this one. And we are using those as we move forward in uh, making changes or uh, additions to the actual plan that we will be submitting. So we really appreciate the comments. That's best to know what's out there in the field. A lot of you here are practitioners district superintendents to uh, principals to teachers. So thank you very much for commenting. 
So um, let's see. Oh, first comment is the one above. In mathematics, one has to give stimulating problems. They come from supplementary books on Singapore math. Um, certainly, those those things can be examined. That's that's one of the things we say our curriculum uh, or our content level experts in reading and math and so on try to make sure that we have materials that they're educated in the materials that are out there. We will certainly pass this on to them. Um, Singapore math is nothing uh, is not new to people. It has actually been very successful, and I certainly agree with the comment. Uh, will asks. Is this state still distinguishing between standalone and supported alternative schools based on enrollment and accreditation? We don't have um, uh, Michelle Clement Taylor here, who does really work with alternative schools. But yes, we do. We do look at a school. That if I can't, haven't answered this correctly, will I will talk to Michelle. We get back to you specifically on this. Um, but of course, a standalone and supported alternative high school, um, I'm thinking you're looking at some things that are sometimes an alternative, but it's considered a program, and that then affects extra funding or not extra funding for a school. So I can review that. My understanding is there are alternative high schools that have their own name, their own number, receive their own um, actual per pupil or you know their own allotment through their the state funding. So my understanding is that that is uh, that is still a distinct group. Those would be the ones that we would be considering in the alternative high school category, but I will verify that. Thanks Will for the question. Let's just go back through the questions again. If we could pull the question thing down. Um, good question. Uh, some of the other thoughts that you might want to uh, determine, um, what are the most helpful ways that we can support you? We've talked about a lot of that and got some good op opportunity here. What should we stay away from and leave completely to the local school district, even if the school is underperforming? To be honest with you, that's that's an important question. If you have any thoughts on that, we would appreciate that as well. Um, and then how should the state intervene with low-performing schools? Again, I think we've talked around about some of those questions, but any others you have would be good. And again, how should you exit this comprehensive support? What would show that you are no longer either in that lowest 5% or that you are you are showing growth or you are showing proficiency. Those are just thoughts we had. So these are just kind of remind people, give you some time to think about questions. Okay, Margaret, her question is, how do we see or envision local school boards participating or not in the three-year process if a school is identified as low-performing low school? That's an excellent question. Um, what we do know from past practice is that local school boards um, do have the option to utilize funds that the State Board of Education can authorize for them in terms of uh, board uh, training. And it's very possible that uh, the, uh, the board can be trained in things that would be supportive of what would increase student achievement and what would um, really help this school make a turnaround. Um, I'm going to take one particular little piece. So if you have one of the things you notice in your needs assessment that you have a lot of teacher turnover, uh, how can the board proactively support the superintendent in attracting retaining good teachers and uh, keeping the folks there that can build the continuity for your program. So the training they might get would be on those kinds of strategies that would be helpful. Um, that's just one idea that I have had. Uh, but once again, um, again, 
we don't want the board to be not involved, but to be involved. Sometimes not involvement um, can mean a lack of uh, support or interest as well, and that that does not help a superintendent. So make different, make changes. Margaret, it's also important to note that your local school board will approve your your school's improvement plan um, that you develop in that first year. So their involvement really starts in that first planning year in how you'll address your low performing status um, moving forward throughout that cycle. So that would that would happen in conjunction with school leadership and district leadership. So your local school board is involved from day one. Um, and then in addition to that, the other resources that are available to the board, as Marcia mentioned, would come into play. Um, and that would include things like um, reviewing assessment results and data analysis and understanding, you know, uh, training in, in assessment and data literacy. So as one example, you know, and that's my hat as the assessment director. So, um, but there are other opportunities, you know, for training for school boards as well with those, those additional funds. But from the onset, district um, school boards would be involved. And I think that answers um, the previous question was, what is the level of commitment on the part of the local board members, um, you know, signing off on the plan um, initially, and then to what extent their local involvement continues and commitment, I think, um, is really at the discretion of that local school district. But with the, um, with their signature on the, on the plan uh, to address school performance, um, I, I would think their commitment would be very, um, very solid going forward. I like, uh, Amy, thank you for this. It gives us an opportunity to talk about some of the things we're looking at. Where will positive takeaways from successful improvement plans be posted or shared? We haven't even quite taken it to where it will be posted or shared. But the fact that we do want to uh, have a system, and that's what we did, we've worked out first, and we're still in the drafting process of that, and that is how would we recognize um, schools that have shown high growth, uh, high achievement, but we have included that in the plan that we want to do that as well. And the purpose for that, of course, is to have role models out there or match up uh, like schools in terms of demographics and uh, their location with other schools that have been able to show high growth or uh, high achievement. So I think that's a great idea. Where we'll post it, um, we'll, <laughs> we'll work on that. That's because that's a great, great suggestion, and it's actually a requirement in Title I that we actually uh, I, we notify, not notify, but that we take notice or have some way to share uh, how, the good examples of how to get things done with others who are looking to find uh, strategies to improve achievement. Once again, thanks for this robust conversation. It's been it's very helpful, um, and uh, we learn we learn a lot about this as we listen to your comments and where we see your questions coming from. If you don't have any further questions at the moment, but you think of something later, please contact us and uh, um, because we want to continue this discussion. Uh, and also, there is an opportunity on the ESSA State Plan, Consolidated State Plan website, which is a link on the last page of this slide, um, where you can provide public feedback too. So do we have any more questions at this time, Michelle? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, we have a suggestion. Okay, 
Kitu, looks like you have a question or a suggestion. Or suggestion. So we're open. What do you have? The question is, is it possible oh, is it possible, sorry, to go beyond the common core for math? Um, I might be taking this in a different direction than you were looking for, but I think um, if we just take and I notice you use small letters, not capitals, and common core, there certainly are basic things that we want to be sure our ch children know. Uh, I'm not referring to the, a movement of Common Core or anything in my response. But whatever it takes is sort of our motto with how we help schools. And we did, I think we did this because, first of all, because we stole it from a district, <laughs> Pocatello district. Yay, Pocatello. They are the ones that shared that comment, and we really appreciate that. So whatever it takes to work with a student we need to do. I'm not sure I answered that, but um, uh, I say this because students need to master times tables all the way through the 20. Absolutely. And, and the only good. thing I would add, Marcia, is that Idaho does have math content standards, like, like you said, for each grade level that uh, students are uh, expected to know and be able to do. Thank you. I'll just read. Uh, we've only got a couple minutes before we close, but additional comments. Uh, common Core times tables from 1 through the 10. And the math content standards prevents good ideas from entering the classroom. Thank you for the comment. Okay. As I mentioned before, uh, we, we are very interested in continuing this conversation. You can um, do that in a couple of ways. One is to contact us at any time, and the other one is to visit the link on the slide right now, and that will take you to the sixth uh, version of the Idaho Consolidated State Plan. Um, there's an opportunity to also uh, complete a uh, public forum feedback form um, and we just thank you so much for joining us and participating today in this webinar and we do uh, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.